Well, we welcome you to the fall session of public lecture series of Class of Freedom. Tonight's session will be on virtualization, nuts and bolts of clouds. We may be very lucky to have two speakers tonight. They are Evan Open Source Exodus of Nessus for the evening, Mr. Harish Delay and Mr. Father Todd. Together, they will be discussing the different types of hypervisors available in the market today and their respective strengths and weaknesses. They will also be sharing with you successful roadmaps to virtualization by the open source model, including associated strategies and insights gained by key industrial players, so you can also create scalable, agile, and secure cloud environment for your organization. Mr. Pillay has been the open source evangelist with Great Hat Asia Pacific since September 2003. He also helped senior management and technical positions at Brocard Leisure, Sambal Media, CSA Automatic, and CSA Domain. Mr. Pillay co founded the Linux Business Group Singapore, and he's also a fellow of the Singapore Computer Society and a member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Mr. Gordon Hoff is Great Hat's cloud evangelist from its Massachusetts office in the U.S. Before Red Hat, he was an IT industry analyst who was frequently quoted in publications like the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Without further ado, let's put our hands together and welcome to the lady. Thank you. Uh, the phone mic. something before the end of this session, right? Could you write down whatever it is that you want to find out? If you have a piece of paper. If you have. If not, you can hear it in your, in, your, in your mind. I think we can only call seven words at any one time, so we may forget. Right? Am I right? Something like that, right? So can you, can you just write down what is it that you need to find out by the end of the session today? I have Gordon here as well. I uh, managed to hijack him from the airport and bring him here. Uh, <laughs> was trying to escape, I said, no, it's not leaving. Uh, <laughs> so we are here to help you understand and appreciate uh, this thing called the cloud and how it happens and why virtualization is the way to make it happen. So if there are some things related to open source, virtualization, the cloud, please write down the questions. If you want to you know, type it in, that's fine too. So what I want to do is I want you to tell me the questions. I'll write it up on the whiteboard. And what I'd like to do is, during the session that we go through, we'll try and answer the questions that you have. Okay? So, I'll keep quiet now, and you tell me what you want to find out. First person, anyone? Yes? Uh, what are the implications of cloud computing for security? Okay, so it's about security, right? Anybody else with a similar kind of thing? No? Okay, come on. Very important. Value proposition of what? Pretty much the whole crop that you want to own. Okay, cloud, okay. Anybody else with a similar form? Okay, somebody else, third one? How do you uh, continue with the cloud parent page in terms of this? And base number. Uh, 
top corner. Video streaming? Is that, is that, is that yeah. right? Video streaming? Video conferencing, video streaming. Video in the top. So filter, filter internet access on the top. So filter internet and the top. Basically, that's CS guys. And the top. It's for CS guys. Yes, somebody else.
totally utilitized thing. And that, in turn, actually very much relates to some of these questions that we were getting here around security and privacy and what I might more broadly call governance, because it isn't one single thing. So let me cut you through the storyline here for a few minutes over how cloud computing has come to develop. This is the remains of a textile mill not very far from where I live in Massachusetts. This was a very common thing to have around where I live in central Massachusetts. The reason being that in New England, we have a lot of swift-flowing little rivers. This is a favorite whitewater canoeing destination for a number of friends of mine. But back in the late 1800s, there would have been a dam across that river, and they'd have been directing the water flow down through these complicated stone waterways and flumes and so forth. And it would go to a turbine like this, and that turbine would turn belts and drive gears and all that kind of stuff. This was really important for the mill because this was essentially its competitive advantage. The more power you had from water, the more textile machinery you could drive, the more cloth you could make, and the more money you made. But it was a very customized system, had to be adapted to the river, had to be adapted to the machinery, but it was at the core of your differentiation, so it was important. This was the big ERP of the day. You really didn't like having to do all this stuff, but it was a cost of doing business. So what happened? Electricity came along. To be precise, AC electricity, which was generated by big power plants. It was standardized. I mean, you, you had to get a particular bolt and cycle, and you, know, you didn't call up the electric company and go, what I really want is a 38 hertz electric current. You know, they're not big on doing that kind of thing. And you paid as you went. You know, you just, you know, how much electricity do you need? Well, pretty much, you know, subject to having the infrastructure in place. You get bill at the end of the month, you pay it. There's no advantage in being a better electricity consumer, what you do with it. And that really is what utility is. Now, the idea that this same idea could apply to computing I mean, it has occurred in various forms for a long time. One of the latest incarnations um, came in the form of this book by uh, a chap of uh, Harvard Business Review, uh, Nick Carr, who wrote a book called The Big Switch. And in The Big Switch, uh, Nick Carr basically said, hey, this locally generated computing stuff this is industrial revolution type of thing. You know, it doesn't belong in the 21st century. Instead, we have huge computing power plants, like this one of Google's that's on the banks of the Columbia River in Washington State because hydropower is cheap there. And basically, that's the kind of place that computing is going to be done is a really nice, compelling story, and Nick's book is a great read. There's only one problem with it, which is that it's not actually true. Um, and yes, I do like to quote myself, it adds spice, I think it was Oscar Wilde who said that originally. Why isn't it true? Well, I think some of you identified some of the reasons it's not true over here, because Electricity is this standardized thing, at least the way we deliver electricity as a utility. But instead, all those things over there are differences when it comes to computing. Um, some of them are technical, bandwidth, 
latency. You know, one great one you know, great news story I read over the past few months is uh, a company called Hibernia Atlantic uh, was laying a new fiber optic line from I think it was Halifax to London, in any case the transatlantic line. And the purpose of this was to shave off some teeny tiny fraction of a second off a financial trend, a financial trade that happened between New York and London. That is not a commodity utility. A lot of other things here relate to more regulatory or more legal requirements or that type of thing as well. So, um, you know, so I think there's some questions up here kind of related to uh, data privacy and protection, or perhaps logging of transactions that happen. Um, in a financial industry, you have a very specific set of requirements. Uh, healthcare, I'm not specifically familiar with the healthcare regulations in Singapore. In the United States, we have something called HIPAA, in addition to a number of other regulations. And one of the thing, one of the dynamics that's happening there as a result is that um, there's a lot of interest in government, but also in some vertical industries over having what are sometimes called community clouds that basically are a number of organizations sharing a resource that complies with the needs, the regulations, uh, the specific requirements of that particular group, uh, whether, whether it's government or companies in an industry, whereas sort of a generic low-cost provider like Amazon, for example, may not meet those specific requirements. And this provides a way to maybe pool some resources and get some more scale than you wouldn't have otherwise. So, kind of the way I've sort of structured it, some of the talk through here, and, I, and we'll kind of go into some of these various topics as we go through here, and we'll hit them at the end of what we don't, is to think about maybe what's a different model to think of as cloud computing and the way it's developing. And one that is sort of interesting to me that actually maps pretty well is of all things the automotive industry. So, does anyone know what we're looking at here? Someone must know. What kind of cars does it see in here? Yes. So early Ford manufacturing, small team, not the first cars, but generally credited with the first automated assembly line. And you can have them in any color as long as they were flat. Not really a utility, but you know, the idea that you just could get that one kind of car. Today, of course, enormous variations of cars and vehicles serving different purposes. Uh, you know, you think you go to have a Formula One race here soon. Very cool cars, technology is absolutely amazing probably not what we want to um, commute in every day. Probably not the best choice. And really, there are a number of things that, in fact, there are sort of interesting parallels between how we can think about automobiles and how we can think about clouds. But one side doesn't fit all I just talked about. There's multiple financial models of how you pay for them and acquire them or pay for their use. Uh, the fact that it's under the hood still matters. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it isn't important. That's very true with a lot of things to do with cloud. When we talk about things like security and privacy. And the infrastructure that they're running, just because it's abstracted away, doesn't mean it's unimportant. Sure, common on infrastructure, and something that I, I think from a Red Hat perspective, uh, you know, perhaps, I think definitely because we come from open source backgrounds, we're very aware of and very concerned around issues like uh, interoperability and portability, and at, uh, really, and you know, perhaps above all else, although not limited to it, 
uh, always having control and access to your data. So with that, I will turn things back over to Approach. All right. So you, you got a sense of where some of the history behind the ideas are coming from. So let's try and see. You know, try and figure out. Uh, I don't know. I guess. Uh, try and figure out what is cloud computing and what it is not. I think sometimes it's easier to talk about what it is not, so that you're clear that's not what we're talking about. Uh, so cloud computing is not just virtualization or the grid. Now, how many of you are running a virtual environment in your organization today? I'm sure some of you are. Don't be shy. One figure out there. I think it's important that you know that uh, that's not the whole story. There's a lot more things around it in order to talk about cloud computing. But virtualization is a, is a key component in that. Uh, uh, so cloud computing is also not just about using external resources. In other words, uh, it's not just about using Amazon services, for example. Yeah, sure, that is a service that you're using. But there's a lot of other... Yeah. 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 Can you hear this? Yes. So much for that. Okay. Um, so cloud computing is not just about using external resources. So not only about using Amazon stuff or anybody else's stuff. It's also a bigger picture about how you do governance. How do you take care of it? I think we have, again, going back to I think question number one, security, data privacy, and, and protection. That becomes important. It's not by and of itself. So cloud computing is also not a buzzword hyping computing as usual. It's more than that. It's not about you know buying more machines and rolling out systems for the sake of doing it. There's you are beginning to think and deploy systems in a different way. Something that was not easily doable before. So how would we go about doing this? The models, uh, the financial models are again an important component, especially for the question that talks about um, implementation in a, in a corporate. How would you want to implement a cloud environment in a corporate? What are your financial considerations? A public cloud, in this example here, or in this slide here, it talks about access over the web typically paid for use. Now, access over the web paid for use is great, if you have internet connectivity. So in the question there, with broadbandless cloud access or filtered internet and the cloud, that becomes a problem. So if you're providing this as a business solution for your customers, can they access it? Where is your target customer base? Where are your employees accessing it? You may end up having to go to the extreme right hand side, which is private cloud because of the nature of internet access. Um, so we have different considerations, and each of them have got different financial implications as well. And in most cases, you may end up having all three, because you have different use cases, different scenarios in which you need to execute your cloud. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah I, I think. Yeah, Okay. Um, yeah. No. I, I think that I think that's absolutely right. And, and in fact, one of the uh, you know, one of the ways you can think about cloud is is as an overall governance model, as an overall policy based management model across multiple types of cloud, multiple types of virtualization environments, multiple public clouds. I think there's there's you know, one question up here about implementing in corporate, and you know, th this is a fairly complex topic, but one point that I would make is that, as we said, you know, virtual or cloud is not just virtualization. One of the ways it differs from virtualization is that it really is this policy managed umbrella, if you would, that spans multiple environments. And one of the really key implementation details in going from virtualization to a private cloud 
is figuring out the workflows that you want to automate, figuring out the policy for the self-service. And those are kind of the really key steps, because if you suddenly give users access to self-service, but haven't figured out what they should have access to, you know, that's, a poly- that's a recipe for security problems. If you automate a mess, I forget who said this, you get an automated mess, and that doesn't do you any good either. So from an implementation standpoint, I think if there were one thing I'd really advise in going from virtualization to a private cloud, it is thinking of it. It's really getting your IT house in order at some level. And that, that forces you to think through your own uh, enterprise architecture as well. So if you haven't done that thinking, that analysis, you are not ready yet to do this correctly. Certainly you can roll it out, but it may not be the right implementation. Now, I'm sure you have heard of and seen uh, slides that talk about SAS, SAS, PAS, IAS. I'm not sure how many of you really understood exactly where the lines are drawn. So this diagram, I hope, will be useful for you uh, to kind of state where the taxonomy of cloud really sits. On the extreme left-hand side is your typical, you know, you own it all, you run it all, you do everything yourself. So your conventional uh, data center, your own internal IT infrastructure. As you move to the middle uh, one on, on this one here, it says IAS, it's an infrastructure as a service. So the red portion is what is externally delivered by somebody else. Somebody is delivering the service to you. Could be Amazon, for example. And above the operating or half the operating system and above, that is owned by you as the customer. That is IAS. PAS, you go up a couple more levels, going up to middleware, and you own the application and you own the data. And on the extreme right hand side is SaaS, software as a service where the only thing you own is the data. Everything else is provided by somebody else. So if I, you know, I hope that this helps you conceptualize exactly what are we talking about. You may have a mix of these and, uh, stuff based on your needs. So if anyone here uses uh, uh, products like uh, uh, salesforce.com, if you're using salesforce.com, that is at the SaaS level, the data you own. You don't own the application, you don't own any of any of the stuff in the red box. Okay. So I think this is hopefully useful for you to when you want to think about the different kind of services that you may want to use from a cloud perspective. Okay. Any questions on this? Yeah. So what you know, I guess, is the platform Yes, yeah. That concept, yeah. So it, it's written at the top, it's IAS. PAS and SAS. Well, it depends on how the provider uh, runs it. Uh, you know, they may give you a VM environment, a, 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 a hypervisor environment. You load up your operating system on it, and then you do the rest of it. Or they may give you the OS level, and you put in your middleware, and you take over. So it depends on how it is actually provided. Correct. Correct. You decide. As a customer, you decide what it is that you want. That's right. So the basic idea here is you're not you're not incurring the cost of acquiring these components. Okay. Any other questions on that? Yeah. The, the one the one thing I would just add in the operating system is that uh, you may very well want a provider who can for instance who has the update infrastructure in place in order to keep that operating system image up to date. I mean, you can certainly bring your own operating system, but if if you kind of want it being updated in place, uh, like Amazon does for Red Hat and a couple other uh, Linux operating systems, 
you know, it's not, it, you can bring your own, but there may be some advantages in where it's kind of a supported operating system through a cloud provider. Yeah, question. Say that again. The what is the middleware? What is middleware or what? Uh, well, in this, well, in general, middleware is something that uh, shields the application from the operating system. In general, that's what it is. What it's trying to do is, uh, so a, a, an, an example of middleware set of technologies is something called JBoss, uh, which allows you to write Java-based applications that you can load up onto a JBoss enterprise uh, platform. And JBoss enterprise platform can run on any operating system. So you write once and you run it everywhere. So it helps you to be able to leverage uh, whatever underlying OS and technologies that you may have, but you keep your middleware the same across the board. So that, that's an example of middleware. So a PAS provider potentially can provide different middleware? Um, yeah, they could. I mean, I, I do know that Amazon has got JBoss as they, 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 they do provide a PAS environment, they do have an instance of JBoss that you can acquire. And you load up your application on top and do your data and do whatever else you need to run. Yeah, I mean, platform as a service is probably a little more complicated, a little more varied than, the, than IAS and SaaS is. There's really a number of different flavors of platform as a service out there. There's something like JBoss, running on infrastructure as a service. There are uh, very platform provider specific pages like Google App Engine that you basically use Google specific APIs but can only run them on Google. Uh, you have Salesforce, the Sports.com pads, which is really kind of add-on applications to Salesforce. There's a lot more variety in terms of what PaaS is than there are in those other two categories. Any other questions? Great. So infrastructure at the end of the day matters. Um, uh, well, yeah, just sort of what so the kind of narrative that I use for this slide. Some of this is from. Uh, various global road tour I've been doing over the last year or so. And you know, even if you're a person that doesn't tinker with engines within your car, um, for that matter, especially if you are, you want an engine that when you turn the key and the ignition, you know, works and that you don't need to go in and tinker it. So the the bump, the message here is that a lot is happening under the covers that you may not have direct control over or normally see in a cloud computing environment. But I would actually argue that makes it more important and not less. So now that you've heard about you know, cloud and some, some of the thoughts behind it, so where do I start? How do I do this? So we have a sort of a three-stage, three-phase process to get there. Um, the first one is to consolidate. Virtualize your servers. If you are not virtualized yet, and you want to go to the cloud, that's a bit too early. All right? you, may, you may jump the gun and go entirely to a, 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 a salesforce.com model where all you do is take the data and, and leave it there and you use uh, the R services and everything else. That's possible. But if you want to move into even your own private cloud, the first thing you have to do is make sure you virtualize your servers. So which virtualization technology should you be using? As the introduction was um, uh, uh, narrated earlier, uh, it's the hypervisor. It's a set of technologies that runs in the operating system. If I go back to the previous slide. Uh, sorry. Over here, this, this boxes here. Virtualization. This is where the key technology that enables virtualization to happen is something called a hypervisor. Hypervisor is a generic term. Uh, so the hypervisor is what determines the, the quality of your virtualization. How easy is it to, to be used? How secure it is? How do you manage it? How do you do all the stuff that you need to do from a management perspective? Okay. 
So that's a key component. So there are many types of hypervisors available. Um, you may have, uh, some of you mentioned you already, uh, are already doing some kind of a virtual environment. Uh, the ones that from a Red Hat point of view that we have been talking about for a long time is a technology called KVM. KVM stands for Kernel Virtualization Module. It allows you at this level to have within the operating system itself the necessary smarts to make virtualization happen. It is not an optional item that you acquire. What do I mean by that? Now, let me, let me uh, ask you a question here. Um, so you wanted to buy a computer, right? And you went over to Funan Center. Funan Center is a place where it's like price. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, you, know, you told the guy, say, hey, I need to buy a computer. Give me an operating system, blah, blah, blah. Um, and if the guy comes back to you and says, so, sir, would you like to have uh, networking with it? Would you like to have TCP IP with it? Is that a question that you expect to be asked? No, because you expect to have that networking anyway, right? It's not an optional item, it should be it should be there. It's a given. So the same way, virtualization to in order to do virtualization, it should be there in the operation. It should not be an optional item that you acquire separately. It should be there. I don't have to buy it separately. So from an open source point of view, from a rehab perspective, it is bundled in. It's not a separate item. You have it. It's up to you to use it. It's just like you can have networking in your environment, but you may not want to connect to the internet. That's entirely up to you. But if you choose to do so, you can. All right? So you don't have to buy something special. So that is a key differentiator from our solutions, how we provide from an open source perspective and from a rehab perspective to make sure that you get the best possible technologies for the price that you pay us. Yeah. So Um, Red Hat, well, Red Hat has many components. Red Hat sells an operating system that has got virtualization built in. It's not an optional item, it is part of the kernel itself. Um, I'm not sure how else to answer it. Right, so in a way that you are trying to advocate is that in order to go virtualization, you must choose around the system which comes with Yeah. You, yeah, exactly. You know, so you don't want to have it as an optional item that you acquire. It should be there so that when you are ready to do virtualization, you are there, you know, just turn it on and off you go. So, what's in the industry today is that besides we have other operating systems are pretty much have the virtualization. Yes. Yes. Or they are, they are not. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try and answer in a slightly different way. Um, for virtualization to work, for a hypervisor to work, you need an operating system, period. Because something needs to talk to the hardware, something needs to do process scheduling, something needs to do power management, etc., etc., etc. Unfairly. security, an operating system does all that stuff. Now, somebody like VMware, for example, can and has written their own special purpose operating system. They, they don't call it that. But when you buy ESX server, you are buying a custom operating system with a hypervisor embedded in. Now the nice thing with the KVM approach and the reason that Red Hat switched to that approach a few years ago is that there's lots of work done in Linux by thousands of developers worldwide uh, doing things like scalability, um, security. Um, I think there's a slide on SE Linux later in here that talks to the security aspect. Uh, large page table support, various types of memory features. And it's really, basically, KVM can leverage all of that stuff, which is done, which wasn't necessarily done for virtualization. And if you look at some of the performance numbers that we've been able to get out of, like KVM and things like Spectre, it, it really is an approach that pays pretty well. So, from a server virtualization point of view, it doesn't matter if you buy something special 
or if you just leverage what is already in Linux, or in Windows for that matter, uh, you, you, you need an operating system even if it's a somewhat stripped down one because uh, the, uh, the operate, you still need all that operating system functionality to go with a hypervisor, otherwise it doesn't know how to work with hardware. Sure. Yeah. That's a, very, that's a very, very good question. I think, let me clarify uh, what you, uh, uh, maybe I'll start first. Um, yeah, when, when uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 was released, uh, 07, we included a, a hypervisor technology called Zen. Uh, the challenge with the Zen technology was that it was not accepted upstream in the Linux kernel. For those of you who just lost me there, <laughs> the, the Linux kernel is the core that runs in a Linux operating system. Uh, there are thousands of developers around the world who add and take away stuff in that kernel. If a code has to be included in that piece of kernel, all the developers have to sort of agree. If they don't agree, it doesn't get included. If it doesn't get included, then if you want to do the stuff for yourself, your special juice or your special stuff, then you're on your own to look out for it yourself. So you don't have the benefit of the rest of the open source community, the kernel developers, who may be working for your competition. Uh, your competition, right? You may not, you don't have the benefit of them looking at the code as well. So Zen was never accepted upstream. Uh, and as a result, from Red Hat point of view, because the market required a, an operating system with virtualization in it, we shipped Zen in 2007, knowing very well that the kernel didn't accept it. In the meantime, KBM was a project started by the same people who sort of worked on Zen as well, learning the mistake that they did when they built uh, Zen and upstream didn't accept it, they said, okay, let's start it fresh. They came from a different approach, and that approach was accepted upstream. Because it was accepted upstream, now you find that almost every other Linux kernel, uh, uh, Linux provider is also including KVM. The Zen will continue, and from a Red Hat point of view, we will still support Zen to customers who are currently using RHEL 5. And that will be until 2014. Uh, that's when RHEL 5 reaches end of life. So until then, we will continue support, but we are encouraging customers to move to KVM, and we will provide the tools and whatever else they needed to move it to KVM. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Is there anything you want to add? Okay. Uh, all right, so let me move on. So, back to the three phases. Virtualize your servers. That's the first thing you need to do. Okay. After you've done that, moving from physical to virtual, you can now start the process of creating your own private cloud within your own organization, within your own data center, without having to move anywhere else. The last part, adding a public cloud, is purely optional. You may choose not to do it because for security reasons. Or you could be in an environment that says, no, I cannot touch the outside world at all. It has to be entirely internal. That's fine but you do get the benefits of moving to a cloud-based platform, cloud-based environment. Okay. So how does Red Hat make all of these actually happen to you, uh, for, for, for the average customer? Uh, this is a chart that depicts the entire open source community, which comprises the entire planet. Whoever wants to contribute, whatever it is that they do. That's the outer ring. It's called the open source software community. From the open source software community, interesting bits of code, interesting ideas, whatever it is, finds its way into the middle set of rings. This uh, darker blue is Fedora, which is an operating system, the next space operating system, that Red Hat sponsors. Okay. 
as well as the JBoss, which is a middleware, to answer the gentleman's question there. That's a middleware set of technologies. So good ideas from here finds its way into these two projects. These are open source projects. Anybody can participate. Anybody. You can take the code and you can do whatever you want with it. You can add to it, take away from it, do whatever it is. And at some point in time, a snapshot of this is taken and brought to the core to create enterprise quality products for customers. And we call that Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That's the, the lighter red, and the darker red is the JBoss Enterprise stuff. And when we do the additional engineering, hardening, whatever else that needs to be done, bug fixes, security fixes, it gets fed back to the outside as well. So it is a two-way street, it's not a one-way street, it's not a take and take and never give anything back. Because we have to sustain the open source community. And that's how we do what we do. That's our secret sauce. This is how Red Hat has been sustaining the business of providing open source technologies to businesses. Okay. We mitigate risk through long-term maintenance and support. So whatever we ship to our customers in the center, the red and dark red circles, we support the customer based on the support requirements they have for a period of anywhere between 7 to 10 years. When we ship something, between 7 to 10 years is the support that they can acquire from us. 7 to 10 years is a very, very long time from, from any product perspective. Okay. Yeah. Th thanks for asking the question. We don't sell licenses. Okay, what we do provide is we provide a subscription to our customers. Okay, so if you buy a subscription from Red Hat, for example, and you buy a subscription for Red Hat Enterprise and it's this uh, dark, uh, lighter red uh, circle here, you will buy a subscription to the RHE, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It, I don't care what version it is. It's version, it doesn't matter the version. So when there's a new version, if you are still a subscriber to our services, please go ahead and download the new version and carry on. You don't pay us extra just because there's a new version out. That's not how we do what we do. Because we want to keep it predictable from a business perspective. We want to make sure that when you, your CFO wants to know how much it's going to cost me to run these things over an extended period of time, you want to be predictable. Yeah, I hope that helps answer that. So we don't sell licenses, we sell subscriptions. Yeah, we typically do an annual subscription kind of stuff. Uh, that's what we typically do. Okay. Any other questions on that? Okay. So that's how Red Hat does in the open source world to create uh, a core product. And from a cloud point of view, these are all the other open source projects that we have worked on. Some of it comes from uh, universities like Condor, from um, University of Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yeah. University of Wisconsin has been around for a long, long, long time. Okay, I think over 15 years. It's an open source project done in the university. Uh, let's see, what else is there? Uh, I think some of these were uh, projects started by other companies that we also participate in. And together, taking some of the good ideas in here, and then we created two components uh, called Cloud Forms and OpenShift. These are two sets of technologies to allow you to create a PaaS, P-A-S, as well as an infrastructure as a service. You want to say yeah, that? Actually, I think this is a pretty partial list of yeah. projects. I think depending on how you count them, I've heard 68 or 69 um, Projects are involved with our cloud uh, with our cloud project. I, I think one point I would make there is I, I think you can just imagine the number of developers who are not at Red Hat who are contributing to those main projects. Uh, um, you know, some of those some of those projects in the management area, particularly like uh, Puppet, for example, are are not you know are, are not even predominantly Red Hat driven. Uh, so there, there's a there's really a lot of work that's been going on. I mean, we're doing a lot of development work with our cloud products ourselves, 
but we're also leveraging just a pretty incredible pool of development work around the world. So, moving right along then. So once you virtualize your computing infrastructure, okay, so all those little uh, dotted boxes are your virtual machines, your VMs. It will then allow you to have effectively, in this picture here, this is sort of like a private cloud. One, two, three boxes, uh, uh, virtual machine sitting on this, another three on this, another three on that. I could move these resources anywhere I want to, depending on my requirements, without having to turn off the system, without having to shut down any of the virtual machines. The machines are still running. These are known as live migration. To move from one system to uh, one physical machine, my host, to another physical machine because I need more resources, I need more memory, I need more CPU speed, I need whatever it is I require that the other piece of hardware can give me. Okay. So these are very important. So this immediately provides you the basis for your own private cloud. Yeah, I mean, the ideal case is more than one physical machine, yeah. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. I mean, the whole idea of a cloud is, uh, you know, if it's all in one physical machine, <laughs> yeah, you just, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, you're having to share everybody sits on one chair. <laughs> so you only got one chair, that's about it. That's not quite what you want to achieve. But the advantage here is this. You can continue to leverage your existing hardware. Okay? You might, by loading up an operating system that supports virtualization, you can virtualize whatever that was running on this physical machine in the first instance. Remember the earlier slide, the first column where you virtualize? Once you virtualize it, you stick in a, an operating system that can handle virtualization. You now have the ability to have your previously uh, running system on the physical hardware now running in a virtual machine. And guess what? This is just software. And what do we typically do with software? We copy and paste. What does that mean? I can make a copy of this. I can have a second instance of the same system. Okay? So I can immediately have all the fun stuff regarding you know, backups and stuff like that. But that also puts in a big problem. How do I manage this? You may have a huge sprawling problem of too many VMs all over the place and you don't know what's running where. And anybody can create it. So you need to have the proper management tools, proper governance to make sure that you, this is not going to go into a runaway, runaway situation. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, I mean, the, and the other aspect is that these may be different virtualization platforms as well. So, uh, um, you know, I think some numbers I saw recently, and I think this was mostly North American customers, but something like 60% of uh, th these medium to large enterprises have more than one virtualization platform. And guess what? In a purely virtual environment, those have to be managed separately. Um, and the I and you basically virtual machines are really great. This I this idea to just copy and paste and fire up new servers, but you're increasing the number of systems under management, number of operating system images you would, which is sort of what system admins care about from a work point of view. And suddenly you're getting this great utilization. But you know, maybe you're actually increasing your overall cost because of management, which brings us to clouds. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Because the scenario in the previous slide, would this virtualization host, if I have limited infrastructure cost, just having one observing that the rest of it is to be used by external hardware and external uh, infrastructure as a service? Not the case that happens. Yeah, there, I think there's actually a slide that will talk that. I mean, a, absolutely the idea here is that you can mix both private and public under common governance and management. That, that's absolutely 
goal of where we're moving yeah. towards. Now we'll come to that in a bit. Now all of this is great, right? So you have all these virtual machines and VMs and blah blah blah. What about security? How do you handle security? The last thing you want is something to be broken into. And we know that in all systems to be broken into. Um, what we have been able to do is work with a uh, the National Security Agency, which is a U.S. Uh, spy agency, similar to our uh, ISD or SI, one of them. Uh, but what was done, this was done in the year 2000, 2001, what they wanted to do is to be able to secure an operating system. So they tried in the 1990s to work with commercial operating systems, a proprietary operating systems to secure them. It succeeded to a point, but you know it was not good enough from their perspective. So they looked at the open source world and said, you know, hey, you guys have an operating system. You know, and Red Hat is a, a leader in this space. Can we work with you to make the OS fully locked down? So the technology that ended up being incorporated is now being deployed in all Linux environments. It's called SD Linux, Security Enhanced Linux. That is to run on a regular environment regular machine is automatically locked down. Now, can I take this idea and put it into the virtual environment? So what we have here is, this is a virtual machine, this blue section here, a second virtual machine, and I can have something called SVIRT, Security Enhanced Linux for Virtualization. So I essentially lock down each of these guest operating systems completely from a security perspective. So whether you run Linux inside there or you run Windows inside here, it doesn't really matter. We lock it out here. That is, again, fundamentally important. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, the security gets kind of ugly and complicated. But yeah, what's basically going on here is SE Linux uses a concept called uh, labels. And essentially what this is doing is it's providing that additional level of protection so if something bad happens in one of those uh, in one of those virtual machines, and or even if there's a bug in this host kernel down here, it provides this additional layer of protection that the get that compromised guest machine can't compromise another guest or can't compromise the the host the you know the host virtualization layer. Now, you know. Security covers a lot, lot more than that, and I'm sure we could spend a couple of hours just talking security, but this is just an example of one of the things that we've done, uh, and well, for that matter, really the Linux community has done, uh, in order to provide incremental uh, protections. And really, a lot of security is about, you know, game, at least the US is a phrase whack a mole. You know, something comes up you have to hit it down. So there's no magic bullets in security, but this is just one example of something we're doing in the virtualization space. Because the, one of the last things you want to have is a scenario is, uh, you know, this has been compromised. So the question you ask is, if my virtual machine has been compromised, would my host get compromised as well? Can this filter into the host? Or, for that matter, attack another guest? So how do I ensure those things are taken care of? You have to ask these hard questions. Not all virtualization technology providers have this. Even if they have it, chances are there's not an open source implementation. The reason why it's open source implementation is important is, I'm not sure whether you've heard of the phrase security through obscurity. Just because I don't sh tell you how we're secure, it doesn't make it secure. It's the best form of security is security that is publicly known exactly what's going on. There's nothing hidden inside there. Yeah, is there a question? Did you have a question? I thought you raised your hand. No, no, <laughs> Yeah, because on this today, the matters, in the recent things, big operation, Sony, IMF, CFAN, what really would you have called? I don't think the uh, in the case, I, I don't know what happened there, but I don't think they were in, in the cloud sense of the world because they have been around. But this was 
I don't think that was a calculated. I, I, you know, I think a lot that these days with sort of the talk about cloud, every time there's a data breach, it's oh that there's been a failure in the cloud, and I mean, you know, I say these underlying technologies are important. There's also been some really horrible security practices in some of these breaches, like password files being stored in plain text and that kind of stuff that, you know, are just bad security practice. I, I would there was just for a second that, you know, magic technology here solves really not cloud security from the IT security problems. It's you know, also very much about, you know, having the right procedures and best practices in place. Security is complicated stuff. It's not easy. It's not easy. Okay. If, but if your technology doesn't help you, it's going to be a bigger problem because you don't have all the time in the world to make sure everything is secure. You want to have as much reasonable automation as possible. And this is what this is providing you. Alright, so Talked about the private cloud, talked about security. So when you load up a private cloud, what are the kind of things you need to worry about? Remember I was telling you, great that you have all these VMs. How do I manage these things? Who's going to manage it? Who's going to fire up a virtual machine when you, when you need one? Do I, as a system administrator, always have to be in the equation? Or can my end users start up their own? And if they're going to start up their own, what rights do they have? And when should I shut it down? A whole bunch of policies. So there is the element of self-service to let them take care of it themselves, uh, to be able to scale. You don't have to worry about every single instance. And as much as possible, a reasonable amount of automation so that you can be freed up to take care of bigger issues, not day-to-day -day running of the systems. These are fundamentally important, whether it is in a private cloud or in a public cloud. Anything on that? Yeah, and, and you know, again, from security, and come back to this because it is a concern for so many folks out there. Assuming that you have set up